Call of Dragons could very well be one of the biggest MMO mobile releases in the last couple of years. And if it's successful breaking into the RTS genre, it could easily rival industry leader Rise of Kingdoms. So today I'm going to give you guys my first impressions on Call of Dragons. We're going to go over all of the pros and all of the cons. We're going to go over things that we know about the game. And then near the end of the video, I'm going to answer two of the biggest questions that people have about Call of Dragons. The first one being, is it going to be pay to win? And the second one being, can it actually kill Rise of Kingdoms? First, let's go over the pros. Let's go over the positive things about Call of Dragons and the things that I think look really promising and really, really good. Now, I will be comparing this to Rise of Kingdoms quite a bit because, of course, this is from the same developers and it is sort of seen as a spiritual successor to Rise of Kingdoms or sort of a Rise of Kingdoms 2, if you will. If you guys are unfamiliar with my content and this is the first video of mine that you're seeing, I mainly cover Rise of Kingdoms, so I'm extremely invested in this genre. And I've played many games that are trying to clone Rise of Kingdoms, so I know pretty much what to look for. Okay, now the first thing I want to talk about that I think looks really promising is the world of Tamaris. That is the world map that you're looking at here. And this map looks absolutely massive with a vast variety of different biomes, different structures, different things that you can interact with and a world that truly feels like it is interconnected in a meaningful way. What do I mean by that? In Rise of Kingdoms, the world map is very generic. The map here in Rise of Kingdoms is pretty bland. Uh, it sort of is all green, there's trees everywhere, and the mountains only serve as a sort of natural barrier between different regions of the map. It's very boring. There is some rivers here and sure the rivers sometimes provide a strategic advantage in maybe KBK, for example, but overall the map just feels like a grassy square and that's pretty much it. I think it's pretty clear that the developers of call of dragons wanted something much more in depth. And I think that's very apparent when you take a look at the world map here for Tamaris. One of the things about rise of kingdoms that people really loved is the sort of infinite zoom feature that was relatively new to the genre when rise of kingdoms first introduced it and that is that you can go from the open world and zoom all the way in to your city without any loading screens there's no transitions there's nothing like that and that's very smooth in a similar way you can sort of zoom into a uh, barbarian keep or camp and you can send your troops here and and sort of do some combat in this zone here and all of that happens sort of within the open world in call of dragons it seems like they have taken that infinite zoom to a whole new level where not only can you infinitely zoom from the world into your city but you can also infinitely zoom into sort of little instances that we've seen in gameplay known as behemoths there may be other examples of this as well but essentially you just send your troops to that location on the map and at a given time you can actually enter into that sort of instanced scenario and i don't know how it works if other people can interrupt that or send their troops in or whatever the case might be but the infinite zoom is sort of taken to a next level it's like the world map 2.0 is what it looks like here and of course the world map and just the world in general in call of dragons looks way better than the world in rise of kingdoms there's different terrain and that's something that they emphasized in their reveal is that there's going to be 3d terrain meaning you actually can have an advantage if you're fighting from the high ground which I think is really, really interesting. So all in all, this world map is infinitely better than the world map of Rise of Kingdoms. It's just, it's got variety. It has meaning to it. It has depth and 3D to it. And there's just more features and more to do here. And I think that that is a huge improvement. I mean, there's even different uh, wonders around the world. As we can see here, there's the Firefly Tree, Stone of Peace, Forerunners Monument, Mountain, uh, Mount Tempest. We don't know exactly how these things are going to work. Perhaps they're going to provide you a specific buff depending on what faction you pick and we're going to talk about factions later uh, or perhaps they will function like holy sites it's hard to say exactly but the fact that there are actual different things in the world with uh, different themes and different story behind them makes the world feel like it's actually alive and not just a blank game map that you 
play on basically the next thing I want to talk about are the new mechanics uh, there's a lot of new mechanics that this game is bringing to the mobile RTS genre one of the more basic ones is just the additional troop type so in rise of kingdoms you have cavalry infantry and archers in this game you have four troop types infantry cavalry marksmen and magic and of course it functions in the same rock paper scissors way where infantry beats cavalry cavalry beats marksmen marksmen beat magic and magic beat infantry but on top of that it looks like each of these different unit types has a flying unit so depending on your faction or maybe some other prerequisites you may have a flying cavalry type or some other player may have a flying magic type so that unit that is flying actually changes depending on the player and I think that adds another layer of really interesting gameplay another mechanic that we've seen already implemented into the game is sort of a knock up feature where if you're attacking somebody in the open field there is depending on your skills or maybe your artifacts uh, you can actually knock them up uh, and during that turn, perhaps they are not dealing damage to you or they're not gaining rage or something along those lines. Uh, but that little mechanic, uh, that little feature, and the fact that you can see it happen in the open field is very exciting. You know, if we take a look at Rise of Kingdoms, there are tons of different mechanics, uh, but you don't really see them happening in the open field. You just see two armies clashing next to each other and then you can read the battle report and it will tell you what happened but you don't really see that too much in the open field you may see a you know numbers change and things like that but the units themselves just stand there fighting each other we also have the new behemoth system which is not something we really see in rise of kingdoms um if we take a look here it looks like there are the there's the giant bear the dire bear the thunder rock there's also the Hydra over here and there are others that are already implemented into the game that aren't here on this uh, on the website but the behemoth sort of function like a holy site in rise of kingdoms where if you are if you are able to control and tame that behemoth with your alliance members then you gain the buffs of that control but you also can summon that behemoth in the open world uh to help you sort of defend your territory right if you if your alliance uh, or your faction owns a certain territory you can summon that behemoth to a major battle and that behemoth can deal damage to the enemy and I think that that is a really cool mechanic very exciting of course it adds more lore to the world and makes things feel more alive right and me it feels like what you're doing in the world is actually connected to what is here and I think that that's really cool on top of flying units like the Celestials there are also ranged units where they can actually deal damage without being right next to that target so in in that way we have true archers right in rise of kingdoms archers deal damage in the same way that cavalry and infantry deal damage and that is by connecting on the battlefield in this game it looks like you can actually deal damage at range and of course rise of kingdoms has sort of implemented that into um specific kvk game modes but in this game certain units will always deal damage at range and i think that that is a nice little mechanic depending on how it functions and how they can actually balance that damage compared to other units well, there's a lot of ways that they can balance the ranged units so hopefully they're not too overpowered or underpowered uh, I think this is going to be tricky to balance but if they can do it right then this is going to be a really nice new mechanic now we also have a road system and a barricade system how out here in the world and I think that that's interesting it seems like if you're marching on roads that you guys own then you get an increase in March speed I could be wrong about that barricades obviously uh, seek to hinder players from progressing or taking over territory so these features all add more depth and more meaning to what actually happens in the world this could actually build an even more close-knit community than we have in rise of kingdoms and and that's really one of the best things about rise of kingdoms uh, is the actual players in the community that are here so a lot of these new features are really exciting I can't wait to see how they're app actually implemented now the last thing I want to talk about as far as things that I'm excited for are the graphics and also the fantasy style of the game the graphics here are just better they are way better than rise of kingdoms um obviously you know you have the same similar sort of uh, art and design but it's a different fantasy theme so here we have the more traditional uh humans elves and orcs and this is very very successful in things like lord of the rings world of warcraft this is very generic fantasy and i think that 
uh the the fantasy angle they're taking here is it's been proven effective so I'm happy to see that they are not reinventing the wheel there they're just using something they know works the fact that you can actually see your individual units in the open field is amazing you can zoom right in on the action and be up close and personal rather than just sort of an eagle eye you're far away and if you're zoomed too close in you're actually at a disadvantage in rise of kingdoms because you can't see what's happening around you um in this game it looks like you know you're gonna have a you're gonna be a little bit more intimate with what's happening on the battlefield and you'll have more precise control so I think again the game just looks beautiful and the fantasy style is incredible and I'm excited that we're getting a little bit of a change from what we're used to with rise of kingdoms all right now let's move on to things that I think are concerning for me and things that you know if these aren't done well they could be really bad for the game now the first thing that I want to discuss and talk about is sort of a superficial thing right this is it's very superficial but if the game developers are watching this this is going to be extremely important for them to understand uh and that is that a lot of these characters are really ugly they're really ugly they're hard to look at Kella like this is a, a disgusting character I have no interest in unlocking this character Atheist massive chin ugly hairstyle I have no interest in, in playing as this character Elena no interest in playing as this Lilia looks atrocious uh this is again this may sound like I'm nitpicking but you have to look at this from uh Hosk actually looks really cool I'll give you that uh but you have to look at this from a marketing perspective right if you're marketing a game and the characters are ugly if they are undesirable if these are characters that I don't like and I don't want to play as then I'm I'm much less likely to download the game right if you show me an advertisement with a character like this or a character like this he's a little bit cool um or a character like this or like this these are not characters that I care about at all Alwyn is just he looks sick he looks like is sickly like actually ill Wanwin is okay very generic mage uh but a lot of these heroes a lot of these characters you can let me know in the comments section below if you agree or disagree but for me you know the graphics and fantasy are beautiful and then you use it on just really ugly characters and and honestly I would I really hope that they go back and they and they reevaluate what some of these characters look like because from a marketing perspective I would not come anywhere close to a game that is marketing characters like this they're just they're so unattractive I, I don't like Craig is probably the only cool looking character out of any of them Garwood is okay but this is obviously just Groot copy and paste Hosk is pretty cool I think he's he's very solid other than that I I just I, I mean Waldir is a generic human male right like that's that's a Nord from Skyrim so I mean again th like this this is sort of uh this is something that they can change this is something that they can tweak and of course this is my own personal opinion but as somebody who you know my job here on YouTube is to make videos that people click and watch right and when I'm designing thumbnails for rise of kingdoms or tower of fantasy or really any game that I play I intentionally look for characters that I think have mass appeal my job is to figure out what characters in rise of kingdoms do people click more on if they're in thumbnails and this maybe is something that you guys don't realize that I do right but I know some characters uh perform better in thumbnails than others just based on what I've seen and a lot of these characters if I'm making a thumbnail for this game I don't know which of these characters I'm going to use for a thumbnail because they're all extremely ugly unattractive and I really hope that the developers like this guy <laughs> what is that man what is that you know if you're gonna make if you're gonna make orcs uh like world of warcraft or like uh lord of the rings like this looks like this is like a baby childish version of orcs this is like an orc for a five-year-old right this is not an orc that i think looks cool it's not a ferocious warrior uh even bakar he's got like these massive like this bottom lip is huge i he's just fat he's just fat that's really all it is right um cool axe decent armor but in general the characters are ugly I actually think that that's going to be a bigger problem than people realize it's funny to talk about now right but uh again are you likely to play a game where this is your mascot right like no what about her no just no next let's talk about factions and factions really worry me because I don't think there's a good example of a game that does factions really really well if I'm wrong you can comment in the comment section below um now let me just say that the idea of factions I love right the fact that we have the well Wilderberg right like the fact that these are like orcs versus the elves versus the humans love it I think the the art style here and the fantasy beautiful right this just looks incredible I love the idea of these factions however I will say if you've ever played Infinity Kingdom before if you've played World of Warcraft before typically having factions divide the players 
leads to server imbalance like historically speaking that's almost always what happens inevitably and that is for a couple of reasons if we take a look at infinity kingdom for example if there are whales in a particular faction they could attract other whales to that faction because usually if you're in alliance with other whales you gain benefits from them making purchases so a lot of the whales will come together in a single faction and then that faction can dominate the server and then either the other factions die off and people quit or they join the other faction and that's that you look at something like world of warcraft for example if you have open world pvp typically whatever faction starts to get an advantage is the faction that will inevitably dominate the server and that's when you end up seeing servers that have 70 percent horde or 85 percent alliance 90 percent horde uh, because players you know once they realize they're on the losing side they don't want to play in that server anymore or they just don't want to play that game anymore and it's very easy to break the balance of factions it's extremely easy right let's take a look at an example let's say this world map has you know for the server we'll say 40 percent of players are in wilderberg 30 percent are in wardens and 30 percent are in league of order right that would sound like a relatively balanced server right 40 30 30 it's they're pretty close but in reality what that means is wilderberg has 33 percent more players than spring warden or 33 percent more players than league of order that's a huge number if you bring 33 percent more players to a fight you are going to win that fight every single time so in, so even in an example where it seems like the server is relatively balanced wilderberg is clearly dominant here and the only way that that would change is if either spring wardens and league of order group up together and then they have a 60 40 advantage or they don't and they lose right and if these two are forced to be allies who's going to be the leader of the two how do you determine the leader right and if that's the case well all it would take is for wilderberg to ally with one of the other factions and then they they immediately have 70 percent of the player base on their side and then they the third faction just dies so it's extremely easy for faction balance to be manipulated and for it to crumble very fast and so that's not even taking into account the fact that these factions probably give you a special bonus to either a unit or a troop type or damage or defense or attack whatever and typically what happens is after a few months people will figure out what is sort of the meta and then the whales will just move over to whatever faction favors the meta and then that's it that's pretty much every new server from there on out is always going to be that meta right and of course there's some exceptions to this but i'm just telling you guys from experience with infinity kingdom with world of warcraft there are many instances where faction systems just crumble so i hope they have a way to balance the factions in the game where you either can't change factions once you pick or you can change factions but it's like a, a hundred day cooldown or i don't know there's got to be a way where they can balance it out so that way there's actually a benefit for a server to have an even balance between the three factions because otherwise it's just uh it's just an added complication to to the game that you know people are going to want to play as one or the other and then realize that okay well if i really want to be meta i have to play as spring wardens right and that just doesn't feel good now let's zoom out to the mobile gaming sphere in general and let's talk about some of the cons for call of dragons in general and that is that this game is obviously going to be competing directly with rise of kingdoms and also the other games that are competing in the mobile rts genre so this game will be competing with Laura's mobile infinity kingdom land of empires there's also the pirates of the caribbean mobile game there's the lord of the rings mobile game and all the other ones are basically irrelevant but if it's going to compete with the top of the top which i honestly do think is rise of kingdoms i really do think i know i'm biased but i do think that rise of kingdoms has the most amount of features and is the best balance between pay to win and free to play and we're going to talk about that later because i'm not saying rise of kingdoms is free to play friendly everyone knows it's not but if this game is actually going to compete in that market either one of two things is going to happen it's going to be good enough to where players leave rise of kingdoms and play this game instead in which case rise of kingdoms will slowly decline and it will slowly just die which honestly i don't really want to see that happen i like rise of kingdoms or the alternative is that this game enters into a market with stiff competition and it can't compete and this game is dead on arrival which also kind of sucks right and i've and, and running this youtube channel i've seen many games try to clone rise of kingdoms and fail over the last couple of years it happens a ton of times and the games just aren't good enough to compete with rise of kingdoms so i guess there's a chance it could fall somewhere in the middle and like just out compete the other irrelevant games but I that just doesn't seem likely right I think this game is either going to go all in and try to steal as many rock players as it can or 
it's just going to fail. So that brings us to one of the key questions of this video. Will Call of Dragons beat or kill Rise of Kingdoms? Or will it be the such, such a good spiritual successor that it is effectively Rise of Kingdoms 2 and there's no reason to play Rise of Kingdoms anymore? Well, the truth is uh, that it is going to be really hard for this game to kill Rise of Kingdoms even if it has a bunch of new features even if it it has a, a bunch of new things that it brings to the table this game has to be so much better than rise of kingdoms that is that it is undeniably the future of mobile mmo rts games that's what that is what it takes to dethrone rise of kingdoms right if you take a look at let's say game of war fire age or lords mobile right and i know lords mobile is still very popular but rise of kingdoms at this point i think is seen as the premier MMO RTS experience and the reason that people play some of the older ones is just because they're still invested or they like the community or whatever the case might be but from a feature perspective I think Rise of Kingdoms really hit the uh hit the head uh, of the nail right there's a now there's a mobile client for Rise of Kingdoms which is very buttery smooth it's very good so the only reason that people are going to quit Rise of Kingdoms is if there's something significantly better right it can't just be slightly better this game can't just be Rise of Kingdoms reskinned right it just can't be Rise of Kingdoms with four unit types instead of three this has to be extremely good right because think about how many years of time people have invested in rise of kingdoms and how much money they have invested in rise of kingdoms it's actually insane right there there's people with accounts that are worth six figures seven figures in rise of kingdoms who have been playing for three plus years do you think those players are going to quit rise of kingdoms for a game that's just slightly better or a game that's just reskinned rise of kingdoms absolutely not this game has to bring so much more to the table that it's undeniably like this game will kill rise of kingdoms it's only a matter of time that's what it will take for this game to succeed and do i see that here i don't know i i really don't know i it's it's really hard to say and of course the game is in early access the game only has like one server at the time of recording this and we don't know how long it's going to be until the game is officially out and what features it's going to have when it does release but what i can say is that if this game is just a reskin of rise of kingdoms with ranged combat and one extra unit type it's dead on arrival it's not gonna skill it's not gonna steal the player base it's not enough right it's just not enough there really has to be a lot here it has to be way more meaty it has to have a lot more that people can get their hands on while also simultaneously being simple enough for uh, the casual player to understand the game right if this game adds too many mechanics and it adds too many features and becomes too complicated well then your casual players are not going to play it they're just going to stick to rise of kingdoms because it's easier to understand right all they have to do is slap cleopatra on an advertisement and boom you know who cleopatra is even if you've never seen rise of kingdoms before in your life right that is that's the appeal of rise of kingdoms it's very casual friendly so if this game uh offers too much too many features and is a world that people don't understand then it that's it. It, it it's too complicated so there's a fine line here where the game has to be significantly better while being appealing to casuals and that's going to be really i'm just saying it now it's going to be really hard for rise for rise of kingdoms to fall to this game call of dragons has huge huge shoes to fill basically if it's going to overtake rise of kingdoms and i don't know if it has those uh, capabilities from what we've seen already and of course that can change i haven't even really gotten my hands on the game in a significant manner and there's still a ton that's going to be coming uh, down the pipeline for call of dragons now the last thing that i want to talk about is will call of dragons be pay to win yes just look don't let's just let's not pretend okay let's just be honest here i know it you know it everyone knows it and this is not something that i'm saying is a problem with call of dragons it's a problem with the mobile gaming genre in general at large most mobile games are pay to win it just is what it is can you get a can you get an advantage by spending money yes or no yes you can great it's pay to win that's it i'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing i'm just saying there will be elements of this game that are pay to win if there's a vip system it's pay to win if you can pay money for gems that you can use to speed up buildings it's pay to win the real question is will it be more or less pay to win than games you're familiar with right will this game be more free to play friendly than rise of kingdoms that i don't know but that is really that gets down into the fine details that is more nuanced and maybe it will be right maybe this game will be a little bit more free to play friendly than rise of kingdoms but do i think that matters 
not really it. either way though i'm extremely excited for call of dragons and i definitely will be covering the game more here on this youtube channel hopefully i'll gain early access to the game in some form or fashion and if the developers want to reach out i would love to talk to them about this game all of the criticisms i have in this video hopefully they understand are constructive criticisms i'm not trying to badmouth the game i'm just from a, a player who you know i've spent thousands of dollars in mobile games and i make i've made content for years about them okay i know these games very well and i i can see problems from a mile away i do that with rise of kingdoms all the time so i'm saying this not as a hater or as somebody who's trying to tear the game down before it even comes out but it's just constructive criticism things that i hope the game does right because i would love for this game to be good it would be extremely exciting to have a rise of kingdoms 2 and i really want this game to be as best as it possibly can be if that means you know delaying the launch of the game great i'm all for it that's fine with me just as when the game comes out if it's good that's all that matters if you enjoyed the video drop a thumbs up on it it really helps out the channel a ton it helps get this video out into the youtube algorithm so other people might actually see it subscribe to the channel if you want to see more call of dragons uh, gameplay and videos comment down below what your thoughts are of the game are you excited to play call of dragons do you think it's going to beat rise of kingdoms for the number one spot i would love to hear from you down there and with that being said guys thank you so much for watching this has been omniarch i will talk to you guys again soon peace